Hallelujah, praise Jehovah, from the heavens praise his name. Praise Jehovah in the highest, all his angels praise proclaim. All his hosts together praise him, sun and moon and stars on high. Praise him, O ye hand of heaven, then ye floods above the sky. Let them praise, Let them praise us, give Jehovah, for his name alone is high. And his, and his glory is exalted, and his land, his glory is exalted. And his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. Let them praise his gift, Jehovah. They were made at his command. Then forever he established. His decree shall never stand. From the earth, oh, praise Jehovah, all ye floods, ye dragons, all. Fire and hail and snow and vapor, stormy winds that hear him call. Let them, Let them praise us, give Jehovah, for his name alone is high. And his, and his glory is exalted. And his glory is exalted, and his, and his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. Good morning, airline. Let's be standing as we worship today. He leadeth me, O oh blessed thought, O oh words with heavenly comfort fraught. Whate'er I do, where'er I be, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, He by his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. Sometimes mid scenes of deepest gloom, Sometimes where and bowers bloom By water still or troubled sea Still tis God's hand that leadeth me He leadeth me, He leadeth me by his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. And when my task on earth is done, when by thy grace the victory's won, even death's cold wave, I will not flee, since God through Jordan leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. You can be 
be seated. What's up, church family? What a beautiful day God's given us today. Uh, you ready to surrender all in worship today? Yeah, I think so. I see some heads nodding. I'm at the right place. Hey, God is good. He has blessed us tremendously. And we want to share that blessing with other people. I'm going to challenge you to share that blessing with other people. Online community, God is with you where you are. Make sure that you like our messages today, because I know you're going to. It's going to be an awesome message, awesome worship. We've already started that way. And make sure that you share it. And all of you, if you have a social media platform, like and share, because that's how people church shop today. And we wanted to plug in, see what's happening here, listen to Ben's message, be changed by the worship, and maybe even this morning, if you will like and share on your phone right now, somebody might plug in to this message and be changed by it. Don't you know that the Holy Spirit works that way? The Holy Spirit is powerful, and He wants to work through you. He wants to work through you this week. So I got a, a challenge for you real quick. Would you turn to somebody nearby and tell them who you know God wants you to share the good news with this week? I believe he's going to give you an answer. So turn to him. Don't overthink it. Just turn to somebody nearby and say, I know God wants me to share his message with this person this week. Could you do that for me? Awesome. I can tell there is joy in the room for just thinking about it. So I challenge you, go ahead, follow through with it. God wants you to do it. We're going to change this world one person at a time. Help them to fall in love with Jesus. I see Donna over there. So good to have her on campus this week. Her joy is just enthusiasm is contagious, and she blesses us a lot. She's our new children's minister, in case you hadn't heard yet. Very cool. Well, I'm going to pray for you, then we're going to get back to worship. Everybody doing okay? All right, ready to pray? All right, I'm just trying to get some feedback. God, uh, thank you so much for life. Thank you for every person in this room. Thank you for loving them, walking with them, promising them an eternal life with you, and promising to be with them every step of the way here on this earth. Thank you for that. Thank you for giving us the people in our life that have encouraged us and helped us come to faith. And thank you that you called each of us to help other people to fall in love with you too. And I pray that you will bless that this week. You will bless their testimony and their gospel message. Pray that lives are changed through it. Please help us to feel your presence this morning and be moved by you and surrender all to you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's be standing up as we continue today. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail, when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail. By the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword. Standing
standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, I cannot fall. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. next song that we're going to sing, we're going to go into our time of communion that we have every week during our worship this, this today. And uh, the song that we sing is called Softly and Tenderly. And um, as we sing this song, it's a reminder to us about the sacrifice that Jesus made for us all those years ago. So let's be thinking about the words as we sing this song today. Um, and just keep that in mind first and foremost, that it's not really about what you sound like, it's about what you're saying and what you're worshiping to God, what's in your heart and your mind, and what, that's what goes up to God. <clears throat> Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling. the portals he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home.
morning. So as I was thinking about what I was going to say today during this communion, I was struggling with trying to find the perfect message to say. And in doing so, it made me think of how all of us as Christians are imperfect people. And we struggle with trying to find that perfection in of being that perfect Christian. And, in do, and when doing this, uh, trying to strive for that perfection can cause a lot of shame, a lot of guilt in our conscience because we're trying to do it in ourself and are not looking for Jesus. Uh, and, but the good news is, Jesus was a perfect person who was the perfect sacrifice and for us as imperfect people. So as we go through today and take the bread and the cup, let us think of, not of our imperfections, but that Jesus died for our sins and washed over those imperfections. And that way we can focus on worshiping God. <clears throat> so will you pray with me? Dear God, we're just so grateful that you sent down your son uh, to be the perfect sacrifice for us. Uh, as we just go throughout our days, let us remember that we need to seek you to find this perfection, that it's not just in us. So as we take the bread and take the cup today, we just look for you, look towards you, God, and uh, we just focus completely in you. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, too, I'd like to bring up uh, the offering. Uh, as we have kind of mentioned before, in the back there, in the lobby, there's two places uh, where we can put donations, check or cash. Uh, and then also on the website, there is a link to do online uh, giving, and that is through Easy Tithe. Uh, if you don't go through the app on the website, you can also download the app and be able to donate through there as well. So let us pray. Dear God, uh, you just give us so many blessings in this world, and there's just so much things to be thankful for. Uh, and because of these many blessings, uh, we just pray that you allow us to bless others as well and use it to advance your kingdom. Uh, I just pray that uh, these blessings will truly help, help others, help the church. In Jesus' name, amen. During this time, we also have our children's offering that we do each week, where the kids get to come up and show us the joy of giving. Um, we're going to do it a little different this week. So kids, as we sing this next song, why don't you go ahead and come on up. And if you're going to sit on stage here with me, just right in front of me, line up in front of me, and we're going to uh, have a, a little different thing today. So let's be standing, and uh, we'll sing this next song. <clears throat> My life is in you, Lord, my strength is in you, Lord, my hope is in you, Lord, in you, it's in you. My life is in you, Lord, my hope is in you, Lord, my hope is in you, Lord, in you, it's in you. I will praise you with all of my life. I will praise you with all of my strength, with all of my strength, with all of my strength. All of my hope is in you. My life is in you, Lord. My strength is in you, Lord. My hope is in you, Lord. In you, it's in you. My life is in you lord my strength is in you lord my hope is in you lord in you it's in 
in you. I will praise you with all of my life. I will praise you with all of my strength. With all of my life. With all of my strength. All of my hope is in you. My life is in you, Lord, my strength is in you, Lord, my hope is in you, Lord, in you, it's in you. My life is in you, Lord, my strength is in you, Lord, my hope is in you, Lord, in you, it's in you, in you, it's in you, in you, it's in you, in you. Hey, thanks for sitting up here today, all right? How about fist bumps all the way down, all the way down, all the way down. All right, all right, good, good, good. All right, all right, all right. How about you, Dayton? Oh, all right. How are y'all doing? Good? Do you feel awkward sitting up on stage looking at all the adults? Well, I'm, I'm going to give y'all a little preview of what we're going to talk about today. Because sometimes, believe it or not, the adults don't always listen. So I'm going to need you to make sure, like, were you listening today, okay? And here's something really cool, all right? In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, the Apostle Peter says that each one of you has been given a gift from God's variety of spiritual gifts. So use those gifts to serve one another. So every one of you up here on stage, and there's no age requirement. That's the really cool thing. You have, you have been given a gift right now. So what are some gifts that you've been given that you can use to serve somebody else? That is great. Encouragement. All right, who else? Spiritual gift. I'm very creative. Creativity. Create, I mean, you create lots of stuff, right? What, what are some things you like to create? Cards and drawings. Oh, those are beautiful. Everybody likes cards and drawings, so good stuff. Energetic. You know, some of us need more energetic people in our lives. Anybody else? You're good at building. Okay. I need to talk to you after church. All right. Because that's not a gift that I have. So I'm, I'm going to need your help. All right. Anybody? Anybody else down here? Anybody? All right. So, oh. Loving. loving. Oh, we, we could all use a lot more loving people in this world. That's great. So I want you to think about the, a gift that you have. And remember that God gave you that gift. And it's never small when God gives. What you may think is small makes a big difference in someone else's life. Mm -hmm. So this week, will you all use one of your gifts that God's given you to serve somebody else? Are we on the same page? Can we do that? We good? All right. Are we awake? All right. All right. So, Miss Dona has some stuff for you, but before she, she does that, can I pray for, for all of us? All right. Let's pray. Father God, I, I thank you for the, the children who are up on stage right now and for the lives they represent, the families from which they come. And God, for the hope that they are for your church. Father, I thank you for their, their tender hearts. And I pray that, that this world will not uh, damage their hearts, God. That, that, that they will look to you for strength and for healing and for peace and for joy. And Father, I pray that you continue to watch over them, God. 
Thank you so much for their lives, and thank you for the gifts that you've given to each one of them. I can't wait to hear how they use those gifts this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thank you all for coming up on stage. Be sure to see Miss Dona. You know you've been around somewhere for a long time when you can remember almost when his daddy was doing the same thing. <laughs> so back in, this is hard to believe, 1987. Who, who in here or who online remembers 1987? Yeah. Some of you think I was alive, but I'm not sure I remember 1987. Well, in 1987, this, I, I can't believe it's been this long ago, a band named R.E.M. Re re released an album called Document. Anybody, any R.E.M. fans in here? Anybody from Georgia? No? No? Okay. So they had a song on there called It's the End of the World as We Know It. Do you know the rest? And I feel fine, right? So when my two older kids were, were much younger, I said, I will give you money if you guys will memorize the lyrics to this song and sing it. I was envisioning that our family was going to go find karaoke night somewhere and we were going to crash the whole party. And, and people are going, oh, look at those two kids. That's amazing. They know all the words to this song. And needless to say, they turned me down. And I tried to bribe them, but evidently dad's pockets were not deep enough to get them to do this song. But the, the whole point of that song was how well, the end of the world, what do we do when it's the end of the world? What do we do when we're facing some catastrophic change and we know it's coming, we know it's happening. How in the world do we, do we deal with that? How do we process it? Or as the Apostle Peter is going to write about in our text today... How do we live in a way to prepare for what we know is coming? We're in 1 Peter chapter 4 today. We're going to pick up in verse 1. So if you'll open up your Bibles or your, your favorite Bible app, we're continuing to work through the study of 1 Peter. Now before we get there, I actually did some research this week on how to prepare for the end of the world. Now if you're really bored today, Google... How to prepare for the end of the world. And you're going to get all sorts of helpful sites giving you pertinent advice. And a lot of, the, a lot of them, there were some out there that said, you, know, you better be right with the Lord. And then, then they would tell you their version of what it means to be right with the Lord. But a lot of them also dealt with very practical things. Here's one website that I found. Eight things that you need to, to, to have to prepare for the end of the world. Number one, you need to have water. They actually use the words a substantial amount of water. So this particular website, and I'm not poking fun at anybody because I have no stones to throw here, but they said they recommend getting a 550 gallon tank of water and putting it in your backyard. They said, if you don't have that, if you don't want to do that, then, then store all your closets with gallons full of water. So this week, if I go to the grocery store and I see your shopping cart full of water, I know that you went to this website. Secondly, have a filtration system. Thirdly, have lots of food on hand. The food that doesn't expire. So even though canned goods are good for up to a point, they recommended dry goods. They last longer. Medical supplies... Uh, uh, number five, a fire starter plus gas. Number six, tactical survival gear. I'm like, well, that's like 90% of the men here at Airlines, so they're covered on that one. Number seven, protective clothing. And number eight, an alternative power supply. All through our lives, we're told how to prepare for the future. 
Sometimes we receive financial advice. You need to have this amount put in this, this, this account, and you need to make sure you're tracking your, this over here, whatever investments you're doing, and you need to make sure you have all of this. And then there are sites like this one that say, if you're going to prepare for the end of the world, you need to make sure you invest and have all of these things on hand. And evidently, these groups make quite a bit of money in giving out such advice. But Peter is going to talk about the end of the world here in 1 Peter chapter 4, and he's going to give much different advice for us as Christians. How should we prepare? Now, back in chapter 3, Peter talked about suffering. And the reason he brings up suffering is because the Christians at that time to whom he's writing have already begun to, to experience some of that but more of an emotional, mental type, social, not really the violent persecution yet. That's going to come soon. And so Peter lays out, here's what you need to know about suffering. And remember, one of the main points he made was, if we suffer as Christians, let it be because we were following Jesus, we were doing good, not because we were doing evil. As he begins chapter 4, he comes back to this theme of suffering. In chapter 4, verse 1, here's how he starts the chapter. Since Jesus went through everything you're going through and more, learn to think like him. Think of your sufferings as a weaning from that old sinful habit of always expecting to get your own way. So the first thing that Peter says here about suffering is, when we suffer... Our attitude should model the attitude of Jesus. Other translations say, Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves with this same attitude that was in Jesus. That notion of arming, that is, that is a, 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 a decisive action. That's not just something that happens. It's something that we decide to do. And Peter says here, When you suffer... Suffer like Jesus suffered. He is the model for our suffering. He's the basis of our faith. Go down to verse 2. Peter continues. Then you'll be able to live out your days free to pursue what God wants instead of being tyrannized by what you want. Now, other translations say because whoever has suffered in his body is, 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 is done with sin. And that leads to a whole lot of speculation. What do you mean being done with sin? Does that mean you actually reach a point where you no longer sin anymore? And if that's the case, I'm still sinning, so what am I doing wrong in my life? It raises all kinds of questions and speculations. But I think what Peter's getting at here is, is, is basically to be done with sin is, is to, to be focused entirely in our lives on what God wants us to do. That's a tough place to get to. Because so much that's marketed to us, is marketed to us for our own benefit. What the Bible has, has a habit of saying, our selfish desires. No matter how we package it, a lot of what we pursue falls under that category. To be done with sin doesn't mean I'll never sin again. It means that I've replaced the tyranny of sin with Jesus. You see, here's how, ten, here's how sin tyrannizes us. You think about what a tyrant does. A tyrant rules people with an iron fist. That's what sin does in our lives. Because what happens after we sin? We feel guilt. We, we struggle with regret. There's shame that's connected with it. And over time, those things may lessen, especially if, if, if our hearts grow cold and hard. But those are all ways that, that sin tyrannizes us. Because it's never about just doing something and being done with it, not when it's sin. There's that lingering memory. There's that pain over what we did. There's the regret over, over wrestling with the fact that I said I was never going to do that, and look, I, just, I did it. And how, how, do we, how do we find a path forward? And Peter equates it here to, to putting Jesus in your life. That's how you do it. That's how you're done with sin. By not focusing on the sin, but by focusing on what it is that God wants in my life. 
Why has God put me on this planet? Why has God made me the person I am? What is God wanting from my life, and how can I serve God in this particular way? Let's go down to verse 3. Now, Peter brings up a really important point. When you live one way and you drastically change your life, that very seldom, if ever, is a smooth transition. I want you to think about a time in your life where at one point you were hanging out with with a certain group of people and something happened in your life. The Lord got a hold of you and you changed your life. I want you to think about what happened when you made that change. Peter alludes to that here in verse 3. He says, You have had enough in the past of the evil things that godless people enjoy, their immorality, lust, their feasting, drunkenness, wild parties, and their terrible worship of idols. Now, there's some things here that may get lost in translation because, remember, Peter's writing in the first century. He's writing to Christians in the first century in another part of the world with much different customs than we have today. Now, there's some things on this list that we, can, we, 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 can, we know. Yeah, absolutely, that's still a thing. But maybe the thing about the terrible worship of idols might throw us for a loop. Like, not really sure I'm tracking with what Peter is saying here. But what Peter is basically saying here is, look, you did that. You're done with it. So leave the past in the past. A lot of times, our past tries to follow us when we leave it. And sometimes, when the past comes knocking on our doors, we open the door and let the past come in. And in comes friends of the past, like regret and guilt and shame. And pretty soon, we're miserable people, and we don't understand why, because those past sins we brought back into our lives, and they do more destruction in our lives than they did the first time around. Peter has some good advice for us. Leave the past in the past. There's not a single one of us in this room who's perfected time travel. You can go home today and beat yourself up over something you did a week ago or yesterday or 20 years ago And you're not going to be able to change anything that was done. Not one single moment can you go back and alter. Do you see how destructive that is? When we allow those those past sins to come back into our lives, there is no benefit to that. It's destructive to us on every level of our existence as human beings. Now, Peter says here, let's, let's talk about the, the price that, that you will pay when you do this. Verse 4. Of course, your former friends are surprised when you no longer plunge into the flood of wild and destructive things they do, so they slander you. There is always a price to be paid for healthy change. Always. And, and Peter's very clear, and he's very honest about this. Look, You've made this huge change in your life. And and the people that you used to run with, regardless of what they say, that relationship's going to change. I mean, have you ever made a major change going back to, you've had a few moments to think about it now. Okay, I I used to, I used to be involved in in these things, and I ran with this particular crowd, and, and then I made a change in my life. And maybe when you told told some of your closest friends in that group, hey, I'm not doing this any longer. I've, I've given my life to Jesus. I'm going to serve Jesus. Maybe they even looked at you and said, hey, that's great, man. Great. We support you 110%. That's wonderful for you. You know, whatever works for you. But the relationship changed, didn't it? The relationship changed because you're not the same person that you were. You're not doing the same things that you were doing. You, didn't have, you don't, no longer have the same values that you had back then. Your priorities, your perspective, your worldview has drastically changed. And Peter makes no bones about it. He says, look, when you do this, people are not going to follow you. In fact, they're even going to get to the point where they slander you. 
Slander is basic oral defamation of character. It means it's words that we speak. Libel is when we do it in print. Slander is when we speak such words and we run somebody down. And sometimes we know something about someone's past and we use that to run them down, which is totally against the teachings that we find in the New Testament here. So Peter goes on here. Because there's going to be a price to be paid for healthy change. And here's something important to remember. When you make this drastic change in your life, it's very easy to go from one extreme to the other. Where you go from, here I was doing all sorts of stuff I shouldn't have been doing, to now you've gone over-the-top, self-righteous Pharisee. And it's very easy to go from one extreme to the other. And it's important to remember that turning to Christ, accepting Jesus in our lives, following him, it is, is about what we announce, not just about what we renounce. Yeah, there's going to be certain things we don't do any longer in our lives, but following Jesus is about a message that we announce. It's about the positive. Have you ever heard Christians talk about... Uh, their faith, and, and all you hear is everything that they're against. And you don't hear, like, what are you for? What is it that you value and treasure? What brings joy to your life? Where do you find inner peace in your life? What does Jesus mean to your life? We talked about this last week, right? If you had one minute to tell somebody why you follow Jesus, what would you say in 60 seconds? Following Jesus is about more than, than what we renounce. It's about what we announce. Let's get back to our text today. And back to our initial question. Go down to, to verse 7. Peter says, The end of the world is coming soon. Now some people say, Well, Peter must have been mistaken because that was like 2,000 years ago. What did he mean by soon? Is he referring to it's, it's imminently getting ready to happen? It's down the road? What does Peter mean here? The end of the world is coming soon. I think on a couple of different levels, as we unpack this, we, we can come away with some different meanings. And, and a lot of the time, it, we interpret things by the situation in which we're in. So for the people it, who, to whom Peter's writing, they're getting ready to endure persecution. That's going to change the world as they know it. And it's not going to be that long down the road where in the year 70 AD, where if you know your history, the Romans are going to completely sack Jerusalem. And they are going to destroy the temple. And that's going to be also wrapped up in their persecution of Christians. So for a lot of the folks in their lifetime to whom Peter is writing, they're going to see the world change in ways that they never imagined. And when we see the world change in ways that we never imagined, in a sense, the world has ended for us, or the world as it used to be. How many times have we said in the last three years, oh, things have changed forever. I don't know if things are ever going to be the same again. The world Ends. So there's a sense that Peter's talking in eschatological terms, like someday the world is going in, and we know that to be true. The Bible teaches that. But in another sense, he's talking on an emotional level here of what happens when our world as we know it ends. So Peter's got some advice for us. And it doesn't include anything on the list I read at the beginning. And it has nothing to do with a financial advisor. So let's see what Peter has to say. Since the world is ending, therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. That idea of being earnest is, is to be serious, sincere. You are all in. To be disciplined, to, to have, have you know, practice this, uh, be in control of your emotions and, and say, this is something I'm going to do. See, prayer is not an afterthought. 
Prayer is not something that we check off. Oh, I prayed today, check. And it's not about using it and weaponizing it and telling people, well, you're not praying enough and that's why you're having all these problems. Peter says, when you're facing something as traumatic and catastrophic as the end of the world, first thing you need to be doing is praying. Be earnest. Be sincere in your prayers. Be disciplined. Make it a habit. So that's the first thing he says. Be earnest and be disciplined in your prayers. And then he says in verse 8, Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sins. So here's what happened to me this week. I was wrestling with this text, and I usually come in here during the week and I practice because what you hear today is not what was originally written. There's a lot of crossing out, there's a lot of tearing, there's a lot of throwing away, there's a lot of hitting the delete button, backspace, no, wrong word, let's do something else. So I'm in here practicing, and I think I finally got a handle on this text. <laughs> yeah. I get to this verse. And I'm up here preaching to an empty, empty auditorium, but I'm imagining your faces. And you guys all gave me a really funny look when I did this. I brought up this verse. And I said, and what Peter means here, and the next thing you know, I said, I have no idea. What does loving people have to do with preparing for the end of the world? And I just stopped. And I'm like, is it just me? What, what is going on here? Why is, this, why is this causing so much difficulty? Because Peter prefaces this by saying, most important of all. Continue to show deep love for each other. For love covers over a multitude of sins. So the word that Peter uses for love is that Greek word that describes God's love, agape. God is love, the Apostle John tells us in, in 1 John. So Peter is equating something with the love that comes from God. And when we face something like the end of the world as we know it, Peter says, you've got to keep loving each other. Because it's when we do this that we are so deeply connected with God. Jesus said, love God. Love your, your, your neighbor. Those are the greatest commands. And when we love in this way, we connect with each other and we connect with God. And then notice a result that comes from loving each other this way. Love covers a multitude of sins. Now that doesn't mean like, oh, so we just go around acting like nobody did anything wrong and we just excuse everything. And No, that's not what Peter is saying here. What Peter is saying here is that when we love in this way, we mimic God. Who in the book of Isaiah, on at least two different occasions, out of his great love and his great mercy for his people, God forgives their sins and he remembers them no longer. That's hard for us to do. Because stuff gets lodged in our brains. At least it gets lodged in mine. And sometimes it's hard to let go of stuff. Sometimes it's hard to, to relinquish our hold on that memory of how somebody hurt us or offended us. And what tends to happen is then that seeps into our hearts and they grow bitter. And love no longer covers a multitude of sins. Let's go down to verse 9. Next thing Peter says to do. Cheerfully share your home with those who need a meal or a place to stay. It's a word for that. We call it hospitality. Now, our world has changed a little bit since then. I don't know how many folks feel comfortable opening their doors to their house and saying, Hey, are you all hungry? Come on in. The world's changed a little bit. But hospitality still should be practiced by Christians. So... Share your home with those who need a meal or a place to stay. 
This goes hand in hand with what Peter's just said about love. Practice hospitality because you love. Because God loved you. Do these things to prepare for the end of the world. And then he goes down to verse 10. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. So whatever God has given to us, the kids were talking on stage about some of the things they've been given. What are some gifts that you've been given? Are you an encourager? Then go encourage. Are, are, you, are, are your gifts acts of service? I think it was, was Raylan that said he's good at building things then go build for somebody, serve somebody. Is your gift music, or is your gift writing poetry, or is your gift cooking, or is your, you know, whatever those gifts could be, use those gifts to serve one another in love. What's the result of that? Go down to verse 11. Then everything you do, will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. Have you ever asked the question, how can I glorify Jesus in my life? How do I know I'm doing what God wants for my life? Peter's just given us some great information here, some principles. Be earnest in your prayers. Serve one another in love. Offer hospitality to one another and show love for each other. Then everything you do, then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. That's how we prepare for the end of the world. So as we, as we wrap up this message today, in this section in 1 Peter, I'm going to ask the, the praise team to come up on stage, and I'm going, to, I'm going to ask all of us to consider this question. Two questions. What gifts has, has, have God, has God given me? What gift has God given me or gifts? And how can I use that gift or those gifts this week to serve someone else? Two questions. Now, if probing those questions causes you to, to need to make a response today, we have people that will pray with you this morning You can raise your hand where you're at, or you can go out to the lobby, or you can come down to the front, whatever you prefer. Or it may may prick your heart and say, man, I I finally need to, I need to really start preparing for the end of the world instead of doing all this other stuff. And maybe that causes you to say, I'm going to be baptized today. Whatever you need today, will you make that response? We're We're going to sing a song, so let's all stand together, and let's consider these questions right now as we sing. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in Him. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is Thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I will hope in Him. Therefore I will much for joining us. We've got our elders coming up to do our closing uh, prayer and dismissal. So if you stick around for that and you'll be dismissed afterwards.